Beavers are quintessential ecosystem engineers. Their work supports species richness and landscape level heterogeneity. They're the keystone species that maintains the health and resilience of the wetland ecosystems they live in. People are decent engineers, but when it comes to wetland, beavers totally outshine us. To say they had a head start is an understatement. In the Beaver Manifesto, Glennis Hood reminds us that by the time early hominid ancestors appeared on this earth, a short five million years ago, beavers had already learned to cut wood and build homes. Beavers build their wetland homes like their lives depend on it, and that's because their lives do depend on it, and so do so many other species. Beavers are aquatic rodents, but somehow, by some magnificent evolutionary development, they came to inhabit arid environments like our Rocky Mountains, not by adapting to dry conditions, but by making dry places wet. Look at this little guy go. Beavers have everything you could want in a solid work partner. They're smart, hardworking, meticulous, persistent, not afraid to get their hands dirty. I'm happy to report that appreciation for beavers is skyrocketing. If you're new, there are plenty of good books you can read to get caught up on the beaver's awesomeness. Reading is great, but there's no way you can really comprehend the complexity, diversity, and sheer magnificence of a healthy beaver complex until you spent time in one. My friend Jessica says the best thing we can do to help people understand is to make them walk through some beaver complexes with us. For our next group field trip, she plans to stash everybody's lunches on the opposite side of the valley. And then, when the lunch bell rings, everyone will have to go all the way across. On their way, we'll make them count how many microhabitats they encounter, and how many species, and how many times they step in water on their way. And then if we do the same thing on a stretch of stream like this, where the beavers have been long gone, well, we know who's going to get to their sandwiches first. We also know which group is going to have the most exciting things to talk about over lunch. But sadly, this is the image of an ideal mountain meadow stream we all grew up with. We all learned to draw streams as lines, depicting a single channel carving through an otherwise relatively dry landscape. So I understand why people have difficulty imagining these riverscapes for the beaver-dominated wetland systems they once were. Joe Wheaton keeps reminding us, complex wetland riverscapes like these are not anomalies. They're natural, and they used to be common, and they could be again. We have to reimagine what riverscapes could be. When we do, we'll realize that we have before us the potential to restore wetlands on a grand scale, one that can affect the function and resilience of whole watersheds. Beaver-mediated wetlands like this are not only natural, they're also the most complex and biologically rich habitats we have. They're stable, resilient, and self-sustaining. This is Tennessee Creek near Leadville. And this is Cucumber Gulch up near Breckenridge. And Sheep Creek in South Park. These are all Colorado headwater streams. And one of the things, one thing these amazing complex wetland riverscapes have in common is beavers. Ben Goldfarb summarizes our relationship with beavers as a history of commodification, conflict, and now, hopefully, collaboration. I like to think it began with coexistence. Native Americans lived with beaver for millennia. Some of them referred to beavers as the little people, a term that clearly shows respect and kinship. In the Rockies, the Arapaho and the Utes coexisted with the little people for centuries before Amer European explorers arrived to find, and I quote, beavers in every water body that offered suitable habitat. Beaver pelts were the riches of the day, a great commodity. So imagine the Europeans' delight in finding an El Dorado of fine fur in the waters of the New World. News from the explorers traveled fast among the people who knew beavers not as wetland ecosystem engineers or keystone species, but as the finest source of fur for making felt. They didn't think of beavers as the little people. What they saw in them, as Francis Backhouse reminds us, were hats. The days of the mountain men and fur trappers are highly romanticized. And it probably did make for pretty good adventurous life for some of the guys out on the front lines. But the other side of that coin is a massive global industry fed by a few monopolistic companies that had only one thing in mind, to extract beaver fur and ship it across the sea by the most expedient and efficient means possible. By all accounts, the boys did a pretty thorough job of it. 
By the 1830s, Rocky Mountain states were considered fully trapped out. The fur trade dr dwindled in the 1800s, in part because hat aficionados began turning to silk as the material of choice, but also because they ran out of beavers. In the early 1900s, Enos Mill was one of several writers to lament the disappearance of the millions of beaver ponds that graced America's wilds at the time of the first settlers came. But he was certainly not the only one to recognize the rich alluvial soils that beavers left in their legacy of dried out valley bottom wetland. These rich alluvial valley bottoms were the first areas to be settled. Here in Colorado, nearly all these valleys became hardworking ranches by 1870. When any surviving beavers returned to the scene, they found their former habitats dried out and occupied by the one species that could probably outcompete them, Homo sapiens. People became used to the simple single thread channels that their streams had become, and they've worked hard to keep them that way. We've mostly forgotten what natural riverscapes full of beavers look like. It's called shifting baseline syndrome or generational amnesia. In the old world, it's been a lot longer, but here in the Rockies, it's only been a couple hundred years. That's how short our collective memories can be. Wherever they can, beavers try to reclaim valley bottom wetlands, but those efforts don't usually end so well for the beavers. Along with competition comes conflict. Three, two, one, boom. Some people aren't even done commodifying beavers. This South Carolina newspaper headline is just a few days old. Um, I'm pretty sure heaven has plenty of beavers and uh, we could use a few more down here, please. Sure, there are many places where beaver activity simply cannot be tolerated, and we need to be totally honest about that. But most of these perceived conflicts happen in places where beavers probably wouldn't cause any harm at all. If we make an effort to solve our conflicts with fences and flow devices rather than with shotguns, traps, and dynamite, I'm sure beavers and people can get along in most places. And maybe it's, challenge, maybe it's a challenge in cities, but it shouldn't be hard to coexist in places like these. Coexistence is the first step towards collaboration. And collaborate is what we're gonna have to do if we're serious about restoring wetlands in the Rocky Mountains. We need to stop thinking of beavers as pests and start thinking of them as partners. The picture on the left is a reach of rough and tumbling creek with active beavers, and the one on the right is just downstream where beavers have been long absent. These are national forest sites that used to be heavily grazed. But like in a lot of places, economic pressure, ranching styles, and management goals have changed. So it's no longer necessary or desirable to maximize agricultural production at the expense of everything else. There's no reason to compete with beavers on this real estate and no reason for conflict. What a perfect place to coexist and start a collaboration to restore wetland. In Colorado alone, we have thousands of miles of stream that are just like this. It could be tens of thousands of wetland acres waiting to keep our, res working to keep our headwaters resilient. What's stopping us? Well, we're definitely a lot la not lacking in technology or resources. The only thing that's been holding us back, in my opinion, has been a misunderstanding of the problem. Our greatest impediment has been a lack of imagination. We, the scientists and restoration practitioners, truly forgot what healthy beaver dominated, dominated riverscapes could be. The problem was so widespread, even the experts were fooled. The conceptual models that practitioners like me were trained in didn't even have a spot for complex wetland riverscapes because the experts at the time presumed streams were inherently simple channels that responded solely to physical forces. They didn't account for biology, and they surely didn't understand the keystone nature of beavers. We can forgive them for, th for this misunderstanding because these geomorphic theories came from a long line of folks who studied streams they were already biologically impoverished and de-beavered. But now we know better. Biologically complex anabranching streams are not strange anomalies, and biological factors like wood and beavers are often critical drivers of stream form and function. Lena Pulvey and Ellen Wall studied Rocky Mountain alluvial streams and determined that complex anabranching streams, like the one on the left, likely dominated for most of the Holocene. Simple incised single thread channels, like the one on the right, 
didn't show up until about 200 years ago. Uncoincidentally, that's right when people turn from coexisting to commodifying and competing with beavers. New scientific models of stream evolution show that wetland systems like beaver complexes are the natural pre-disturbance condition in most alluvial valleys. The condition we see so commonly today, when we're incised channels bisect mostly dry floodplain terraces, are often the result of human disruptions. You know, like the extirpation of a keystone species. Brian Kluwer and Colin Thorne's 2013 stream evolution model makes that clear. The anastomosing wetland beaver complex on the left is stage zero, the top. The incised single thread channel on the right has already evolved through stages one through three due to the prolonged absence of beaver. And this is important because biologically complex stage zero riverscapes are wetlands. And those wetlands get dried and simplified when they become incised channels. A wetland scientist, as wetland scientists, you can probably appreciate, you can certainly appreciate the hydrological, ecological, and habitat functions that are lost when this happens. The pies on this chart show the level of habitat and ecosystem benefits that go with each stage. The shift from a stage zero beaver complex to a stage three incised channel represents a massive loss in wetland and corresponding decrease in ecosystem services. Well, the good news is that by restoring these degraded streams, we have an amazing opportunity to gain back a lot what we've lost. We can do it, and partnering with beaver is the key. The stream evolution model also shows how beavers catalyze the recovery of incised channels from stage three through eight and back to zero, going around the circle clockwise. Beavers do this by persistently building dams and channels that force the trench to widen in a grade. The diagram at the top comes from Ben Goldfarb's Science Magazine article, and it shows the stages sequentially from left to right. In small streams or channels that are not too deeply incised, beavers might bump us back to stage zero in one go. But reconnecting, reconnecting deeply incised trenches takes multiple iterations of the aggradation and widening. And that's what Michael Pollack shows us in this diagram. Fortunately, small Rocky Mountain streams and geologically young glacial valleys don't usually incise very deeply. They tend to recover quickly when beavers return. How do beavers do it? Just like Kent Woodruff says, one stick at a time. If beavers have what they need to survive, they work indefatigably to restore and maintain wetlands because their lives depend on it. Deanna Laurel and Ellen Wool describe the maintenance of a stage zero beaver complex as a po positive biological feedback loop, the upper loop in this diagram. When you have enough beaver dams, you get backwaters and over overbank flows. These flows support wetland, deciduous vegetation, and multiple channels. Abundant wetland is the aquatic habitat and food that supports beaver. Beaver build more dams and ponds and more dams and ponds create more backwater and overbank flow, which makes more wetland. And that grows the plants the beavers eat and build more dams with. And those dams create more backwater, more wetland, more vegetation, more beavers, more dams. Get it? When these biological processes shut down, simple physical processes take over in another feedback loop that maintains the simple channelized stream forms. And that's the lower loop. You can think of the feedback loop in Ellen's diagram as a biological engine that keeps these wetland ecosystems dynamic, complex, and functioning. It's an ecological machine. And the cool thing is that as long as all the parts are there, it functions totally on its own. And when you think about it like this, your job as a restoration practitioner is not to design and build these systems, it's to help them heal. It's really about getting the important parts back in place so that natural processes can resume functioning. That's what we mean by process-based restoration. As Chris Jordan likes to say, it's forehead slappingly obvious. Partnering with Beaver to restore, wet restore wetlands is an obvious path to better habitat, more ecosystem services, and more resilient watersheds. But just because the solution's obvious doesn't mean it's always easy. While we can't possibly overstate the importance of partnering with beaver, I think we often do overstate the simplicity. Dealing with biology can be inherently complicated. There's a lot we don't know and the learning curve is steep. I believe it's critically important as we amplify the scale of beaver restoration 
to go forward with boldness and humility in equal measure. Let's stay open-minded and keep following the science. We have to be practical. Despite what I heard several professionals allude to recently, restoring inside streams is rarely as simple as just trucking in a few beavers and letting them do all the work. We can't let them do all the work. Relocating beavers from conflict sites to restoration sites makes perfect sense. It's an important tool for a restoration toolbox, but it's not a panacea. We need to be realistic and upfront about expectations and the costs of beaver relocation. One of the problems, and I'm sure this is true of the Sierras and many other mountain areas as much as it is in the Rockies, is that many of our degraded riverscapes have become totally inhospitable to beavers. Sites like the one in this picture have nothing left of the machinery needed to support them. You can't just drop a beaver off in a place like this and expect her to restore it from scratch, especially not for 60 odd cents an acre. You know that poor little beaver's pleading, please don't leave me here. Even on sites that have suitable habitat, beaver reintroduction can be challenging and unpredictable. Kent Woodruff, the founder and former director of the Metau Beaver Project, summarized a century of beaver relocation efforts in the West. His table shows the number of beavers released, the number of sites they were released to, and whether beavers stayed on site to build dams. This represents a century of effort. And there are clearly some success stories on this table. Reintroduction can definitely work, but the data also show that it's far from being a sure thing. And the relocation process is a lot more complicated and expensive than many people realize. These aren't rinky-dink backyard operations. The Metau Beaver Project is about as sophisticated and high-tech as you can get. These guys have a full staff and lots of volunteers. They thoroughly assess their watershed. They evaluate hundreds of sites. They hold captive beavers in a repurposed fish hatchery where they let them form mating pairs. Then they release beavers as family units to sites that they prepared by creating lodges and delivering food. Then they monitor them carefully and adaptively manage them for years. And yet, even though many of these sites seem perfectly suitable, only a portion of the transplanted beavers stick. We also need to be careful not to oversell beaver mimicry. Building beaver dam analogs is pretty much my full-time summer job these days, and I'm a true believer in their effectiveness as treatments. But let's be perfectly clear. If we want all our great work to last and keep working into the future, we need to help we need help from the real ecosystem engineers. Don't be too impressed by before after pictures of BDAs, even though the initial response is actually pretty amazing. It's easy to mimic an abandoned beaver dam, but it's hard to mimic an active beaver dam because unlike beavers, we don't live in these ponds and that we build and we don't take care of them. Real active beaver dams work so well because beavers maintain them incessantly. 24-7. Our measure of success shouldn't be how, just how a BDA looks when we're done building it. It's about how well we've promoted and sustained the machinery that keeps the wetland alive and functioning into the future. Mimicking beaver dams can get the restoration process started by taking us through the first couple of steps. If we do our work well, it'll promote natural processes and attract beavers. Long-term stability and sustainability ultimately depends on returning the keystone species. And one factor we often forget to talk about is vegetation and wood. And I can see how we might overlook it, but to our beaver partners, riparian vegetation is pretty much everything. It's their food and it's their shelter. Lots of our impaired riverscapes don't have a prayer of supporting beaver until we get some riparian plants back. Restoring native woody vegetation is not always easy it sometimes requires interventions, and it often takes a long time. That's okay. We can be patient. Our f my favorite beaver mimicry, or my favorite beaver restoration success story didn't involve reintroduction or mimicry. It was about vegetation. The left photo shows the reach in 2008, looking pretty much like it has since the 1800s. The right photo shows the same spot in 2016, after planting willows and managing livestock. And here it is in 2020, after the beavers decided there was enough food and shelter to move in. Enjoy those willows, partner.
And thanks for all your hard work. So long, and thanks for all the fish. There's an ecosystem engineer with five million ex years of experience anxious to partner with us in restoring Rocky Mountain wetlands. Let's help them help us.